Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We continue in our series in the book of Genesis where we are now at a place where we're, we're talking about in the beginning calling. In the beginning calling. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever been to, um, I don't know, you got in the car and you're headed someplace and the anticipation is very real because you know the meal that is being prepared for you? Now, one of the cardinal rules about preaching that you're never supposed to do, of course, especially in a morning service, is talk about food. But bear with me for just a moment. You know the person who's preparing the meal and you know that there is something that is wonderful that's being prepared. So just the other night, we're sitting around a table with family and friends and we're talking about some of our favorite meals that certain people prepare. And so on, on Christmas morning, I know that if we are with my dad and my mom, I know we're gonna have homemade cinnamon rolls. And, and I also know that there's almost a bloody battle between siblings to get the center cinnamon rolls. So we know what's coming. And, you know, when you wake up, you can smell cinnamon rolls cooking. And it is the blessing that awaits. Uh, there are a lot of people whose names I could mention right now. And I could mention specific meals. And I know that if I'm heading to their home... There is something special that is waiting for me. And then we even use the expression, we say the blessing and then the meal commences. Have you ever thought about the blessings that await? The blessings that await. There are some that are just beyond. They're waiting for you and I would even submit there are blessings that are waiting that are not just those eternal blessings that we're going to lay hold on, take possession of. There are even blessings this side of eternity and there are blessings that await. Have you ever speculated on some of the special blessings that God may have waiting for you? Blessings right now, again, this side of eternity, they are hidden in a sense from full view. But you should be aware there are blessings because I know the blesser, blessings that await. Your Bibles are open right now to Genesis chapter 12. The title of our message today is simply that, the blessings that await. If you would join me in Genesis chapter 12 and for sake of context, let's read verses one through five. I'll read and you follow along as I do so. Here the Bible records, now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. The blessings that await. We're going to begin by looking today at specifically what we'll detail as five blessings. Some of them were actually blessings that Abram received 
because he followed in obedience. And some of them were just blessings because God is a good God and he decided to bestow blessings upon Abram, the great initiator of blessing. Let's look at the first one. And the first one we'll see today is what we'll call the blessing of separation. The blessing of of separation. Now, before we look at the passage of scripture, there may be some that say, listen, I've just experienced some kind of separation. And we understand that often separation brings anything but blessing. But in this context, when we start to talk about what it is that God's doing, there is going to be some pain in the separation. There usually is. But there's also because Abram's willing to separate from one thing unto another, there is a blessing connected to separation. Genesis chapter 12, look again at verse number one. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now, clearly, Abram doesn't know all that God was doing and had never been to the land where God was directing. The only thing he had to act on was the clear direction of God. God said, Abram, it's time for you to get moving. There was no further explanation needed. The only explanation necessary was because I told you so. God was being very clear about what Abram was to leave behind. He said, I want you to leave behind your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house. And, and that was it. Abram could have said, okay, got it. Where am I heading? To which God could have responded, don't worry about that. Just follow me. It gets very real when the call of God tells us to leave behind something, but doesn't fully tell us where we're heading. Have you ever ridden a roller coaster that it was primarily ridden in the dark? Where you couldn't see which turn came next. And most of the suspense, in fact, most of the thrill of the coaster ride was not so much that the ride itself was thrilling. It was thrilling, so to speak, because you just didn't know what was coming next. This uncertainty often causes us to weigh our obedience to the word of God versus what it may cost us to actually obey. The weight of some cost. We weigh the cost of all things, not just monetarily speaking. We measure the cost of time, the cost of potential punishment. We measure the cost of relationships. We, we say things like this, if I did that, my parents would kill me. So what we're doing is at that moment, we are weighing the cost of something. We'll say something like, no, I can't afford the time. I have to study for this test. Again, we're measuring, we're weighing the cost of, do I have the time to do this or this? I can't drive any faster. I've had four tickets this month. And if I get another, we're weighing the cost of something. All these are examples of doing a quick mental cost analysis. So if I obey the word of God as it pertains to marriage and the marriage bed, what does that cost me as it pertains to my freedom? What cost might the word of God have on my finances? What does it do to my schedule? How does that impact the way we raise our children to my choices regarding entertainment or education or wardrobe? or our attitude toward our boss or to our neighbor? Uh, how does this, the word of God, measure or cost me as it pertains to those who have more than I do and my attitude toward them? Or the way I look at those who have less than I do, again, my attitude toward them. Ultimately, we're doing a cost analysis on the word of God, asking if it will cost me too much if I take action. We must ask the question, is God's word actionable only when it seems reasonable? That's an important question for all of us to ask and answer. Is God's word actionable only when in my mind it seems reasonable? Or am I weighing my obedience based on the cost of the action? And I would also note that the more our culture drifts 
from its moral moorings of our Christian heritage, the less reasonable God's commands will appear. And how many of us, had we found ourselves in Abram's sandals, would have said, God, that's unreasonable. Seriously, tell me where we're going. What am I separating myself to? And then I'll consider it. But God, if you're just asking me to go out not knowing, that's a really big sacrifice of separation. And I don't know fully at this moment if I'm willing to do that because I'm doing a bit of a mental cost analysis. The principle that Abram's about to act on is a principle found all throughout scripture. And it's a principle of separation based on the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says this. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Remember, whenever you're called to one thing, you are separated unto another. When we come out of darkness, we are separating unto light. God's call would separate Abram from the challenges of his own family history. This is a serious call. God is about to say, Abram, I want you to come out of and I want you to actually leave your, your people, your kindred, your nation, your place, your history to a place to which I am calling you. God, where is that place? Remember, Abram, you follow at my command, not at the information provided to fill in the details of that command. God's call again is going to separate him from some of the challenges of his own family history. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is talking to the people about living in the land of promise. And he says this, Joshua said unto all the people, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Listen, you now are called to separate yourself from the gods of the Canaanites in whose land you dwell. Listen, even Abraham's father, they dwelt on the other side of the flood. And guess what they did? They adopted the, the false gods, the false religious system of the peoples around them. That's what they did. That's not to be what you do. Abram's father served the false gods of the people that surrounded him. This is God's invitation to Abram, and it is a costly separation indeed. But genuine separation always demands leaving one thing behind to apprehend another. Always. A denying of one thing, it means then I open the door for the acceptance of another. I cannot face you as a congregation without first having my back to the choir and the orchestra. And I cannot face the choir and the orchestra without also concurrently turning my back on the congregation. When God calls us to one thing, it is then at that very moment a turning myself away from another. And ultimately God is asking Abram to turn his back and leave behind one land and follow God to another. He's not asking us to run our own cost analysis and consider if it's a good fit or not. He's simply asking us to by faith go out not knowing. It's a call to separation. And there is a blessing awaiting it. You, you might say, well, well, what blessing awaits? This is where God begins to fill in the pictures. And God says, listen, this is what I'm going to do. I will. Let's first of all notice the blessing of multiplication. The blessing of multiplication. We enter into one of these beautiful I will sections of the Bible. It becomes unmistakably obvious who is the initiator of the blessing. You may want to circle these in your Bible as I did mine. These I will statements of Almighty God. God just says, hey, listen, I'm the great initiator. I am the great blesser. Now, I am calling you to separation. Abram, there is something for you to do, but not regards to blessing. That is all God saying, all completely on me, God, the great blesser. 
Notice Genesis chapter 12, verse number two. He says, first of all, and I will make of thee a great nation. The word great that's used here, it carries a lot of weight. This wasn't self-defined greatness, nor was it self-achieved greatness. This was God's promise and God's blessing. And when God himself says, I will make of thee a great nation, it is not a trivial use of the word. There are a lot of implications. We'll mention just a few. First of all, there is a blessing that, that God says, I'm gonna do so numerically. When God says, I'm gonna make your name great, God's talking about a blessing that has some numeric implications. In Genesis 22, God's reiterating the blessing. Verse number 17 that in blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seeds as what? Thy seed is the stars of the heaven, and is the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Genesis twenty two seventeen. There's a numeric blessing. So numerically, God's going to bless. Also, influentially influentially, again, Genesis 22, verse number 18, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. All the nations of the earth, you wanna talk about incredible influence, God's people. He says, in your seed, all the families of the earth. In other words, there's not a family, a group of people on the face of the earth that haven't received some kind of blessing because of Abram and his offspring. And then of course, spiritually. Yeah, numerically, influentially, spiritually, wonderful blessing. We're gonna to touch on that in, 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 uh, to a greater extent in just a moment. But notice what Paul writes. Paul says in Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abram might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith What's this connected to? Did you notice that? That the blessing of Abraham, oh, the promise of the spirit through faith. Clearly, there's not just this numeric blessing. There's not just this influential blessing. There is a spiritual blessing through which all the families of the earth can be blessed. Well, that's the blessing of multiplication. Notice a little bit further, the blessing of elevation. The blessing of elevation. Okay, verse number two again, Genesis chapter 12. And I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. The blessing of elevation. Do you remember just a few weeks ago, we were looking at Genesis chapter 11. And in Genesis chapter 11, there were a group of people that were assembled and they had a goal in mind. And that is, hey, we're gonna come together and we're gonna make our name wonderful. We're going to magnify our name. This was self-magnification. The Bible says in Genesis 11, verse number four, and they said, go to, let us build a city. Let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Man's attempt at self-exaltation is ultimately a vain attempt. It is as foolish as me attempting to lift myself up by myself. Yes, Abram was going to be blessed and blessed far beyond what he would ever fully realize. Now let's ask this, was his name great in his own day? Did he ever see a nation come from his own children? And I would offer to you, he didn't see the full realization of that in his own day. No nation is formed overnight. Yet God was clearly blessing Abram. And by that blessing, Abram was in turn to be a blessing to others. Today, we seem to have a large focus on how to get God's blessing. In fact, if we went to a Christian bookstore and we wanted to read a book on how to be blessed, how to receive God's blessing, sometimes we even talk about the, the wonderful, almost mystical blessing of one like Jabez. Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed. We, we seem to have this focus on how can I get the blessing? It's almost like we're these blessing sponges and we just want to continue to soak up the blessing of God. But isn't it interesting, even in the midst of this profound blessing that God's pouring out on Abram, God also says, Abram, I want you to know in the midst of this blessing, through you, the nations will be blessed. It's almost as if God's saying, I'm gonna bless you to be a blessing. Abram, I'm gonna bless you, but I'm also gonna squeeze you 
so that those blessings that have fallen upon you can also be poured out into the lives of others at the same time. Has God blessed you with finances? Has he blessed you with a technical mind? Has he blessed you with the ability to sing or play an instrument? Has he blessed you with administrative ability, with writing ability, with athletic ability, with teaching ability, with mentoring ability, musical ability? How are you using the blessing of God? In so many ways we are blessed, but we are oftentimes attempting to leverage our blessing to bless us even more or to multiply the blessing in our own lives as opposed to being blessed in order that we might also be a blessing. Well, blessing awaits. There was the blessing of separation, the blessing of multiplication, the blessing of elevation, and then also, wow, what a wonderful blessing. The blessing of salvation. Now, now don't check out on this because I know many times like, oh yeah, 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 salvation. I'm, I'm there, I know about salvation. But think about what God is saying to Abram when God's saying, I will bless. Notice what the scripture says in Genesis chapter 12, verse number three. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Do you see the incredible love and mercy of God in this statement? God is extending the blessing of Abraham to all who would accept it. One commentary I read said this, God's love is seeking to extend his blessings as far as his justice will allow. Now that's quite a profound statement. But it does show some character and some insight regarding the nature of God. That God's love is desirous to extend his mercy so far as his justice will allow. Sometimes we talk about the the blessing of God. The fact that he makes the, the rain to fall, the sun to shine on both the just and the unjust. What's God doing? He's saying, listen, I want to extend my blessing so far as my justice will allow. Sometimes people say, do you know, I think someday, because God is a God of love, I think someday God's just going to tell everybody, come on up to heaven, because how could a God of love send anyone to an eternal separation from God, a place of judgment, a literal place called hell? Well, the, the reason that God can't just take everybody with him to heaven is God's justice won't allow it. But he is extending mercy so far as his justice will allow And it's the very reason for which Jesus Christ did put on flesh and dwell among us. It's why Jesus Christ took upon him the iniquity of us all. It's why the gospel is written in terms that for whosoever will drink of the water of life, ah, let him do so freely. And for whosoever will, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, what does that even mean to call upon the name of the Lord? It means that we recognize that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. Jesus is God, the fitting appropriate sacrifice. He's the final lamb that needs to be offered. And Jesus took my punishment on himself. God then in the person of Jesus Christ satisfied God. His justice was fully satisfied. And Jesus Christ, proved who he truly was when he came three days later after he lay dead in a borrowed tomb he rose again never to die again and he offers his gift of salvation for all who will receive do you say is that really pictured in the blessing of Abraham and the answer is absolutely notice what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3 Galatians chapter 3 beginning in verse number 7 the Bible says this Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Oh, hey, hang on just a second. If someone said, hey, who's your spiritual father? If you know Jesus Christ personally by faith in him, you'd say, Abraham is my spiritual father. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Preach the gospel unto Abraham, saying, here's that same promise, that same blessing. 
In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The blessing that God was giving to Abraham is the same blessing that I have received today. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter five, verse one, therefore being justified by faith, same faith that Abraham had, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What an incredible blessing. A blessing that is extended to all who will receive it. And again, what is this faith in? Faith in the finished work of Christ alone. Well, we have the blessing of separation, the blessing of multiplication, the blessing of elevation, the blessing of salvation. And the last blessing that we see here, it's the blessing that comes that you and I have to enact as well. It is the blessing of submission. The blessing of submission. Notice verse number four. Remember all this was God saying, I will, I will, I will. And now in verse number four, Genesis chapter 12. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Do you know what this is the picture of? It's the picture of Abram simply saying, God, I'm going to submit to your spoken word. It was an uncompromised step of obedience. Yes, Abram will falter. He's gonna have his moments of doubt. But now he has finally come to a place of ready obedience. He's taking the next step. And it was a step that he had apparently hesitated, faltered in doing. D did you notice how Genesis chapter 12, one began? Maybe, maybe this word stood out to you when we read it. Genesis 12, verse number one, notice again what the scripture says. Now the Lord, look at these two words. Now the Lord had said, had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. That's past tense. God had already said, he had spoken to Abram about this. You say, well, how do you get that? I know that's one word, but, but maybe we're just talking about, it's referencing the fact that God had this conversation. Okay, do you remember one of the first deacons preached a powerful sermon in the book of Acts, the first martyr after the resurrection of Christ? His name is Stephen. Stephen's preaching a message filled with the Holy Spirit. Guess what the Holy Spirit reveals to Stephen? The Bible says in Acts chapter seven, verses two and three, and he said, this is Stephen preaching, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father, Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. At the end of Genesis 11, we read that Abram had been living in the land of Ur of Chaldees. And then he moved and his father with his father to Haran. Yes, Abram had left Mesopotamia. Then he stopped in Haran. But God had called him to Canaan. At that point, his incomplete submission, which is no submission at all, was, was, was still what he was living in. He's not living in submission to God. One of the old commentators um, who wrote a beautiful series of, of, of books regarding the Pentateuch, the first five books, his name's C.H. McIntosh. McIntosh said this. He said, God loves his servants too well to deprive them of the full blessedness of entire obedience. God loves his servants too well to deprive them of the full blessedness of entire obedience. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, listen, God doesn't operate on this partial obedience you know, mode of operation. God says, I love you too much to just say, well, you partly obeyed. God's saying, no, 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 fully obey. Abram had started his journey, but Abram had not yet gone out truly not knowing. Submission to God is always an act of obedience and it's always accompanied by blessing. Hebrews 11, verse number eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive for an inheritance, obeyed 
And he went out not knowing whither he went. The thing I believe that must have been pleasing to God was the ready willingness to obey. And true submission is obeying without demanding full understanding. Abraham didn't know where he's going. We know that. We've said this often. He doesn't know where he's going. He just knows who he is going with. And shouldn't that be enough? It was a story of a grandfather and his grandson, and they were fast friends. I mean, wherever the grandfather was, the grandson was right there with him. They'd go fishing together, love to sit on the dock, and whether they're catching fish or not, they just love the time together. They would run errands to the store. They would spend time with lemonade on the front porch. It was a grandfather and a grandson, and they loved their time together. And one day the grandfather says to the grandson, he says, let's go for a ride to which the grandson replied, where are we going? And with that, the grandfather made no other statement. He turned, went out the door, got into the car and drove off, leaving the grandson behind. When he returned home, the grandson was standing on the porch watching for the car to return. And he's crestfallen, he's disappointed. You can see he's sad. And he says, grandfather, Grandpa, what what happened? You you didn't take me with you. And the grandfather simply responded, do you know, every time in the past, you've never asked, where are we going? You just always said, let's go. He said, today, you said, where are we going? As if that would have mattered if you're going with me. Do you know, sometimes I think when God says, hey, hey, let's get going, we pause for a moment and we say to God the Father, God, I'm interested in going, but where are we going? And and maybe at that moment, God also, in a sense, turns and, and at least momentarily closes the door and he says, aren't I enough for the journey? Doesn't that answer enough questions for you knowing that I'm inviting you to go with me. When God said to Abram, let's go on a journey, Abram doesn't respond here with where are we headed? He simply heads out not knowing. And what a special blessing it must be when God doesn't have to use, in a sense, the cattle prod to get us moving. But instead, with just a simple, even subtle hint of desire, we respond. Do you remember when the Bible talks, speaks about, he shall guide thee with thine eye? You know what that's like, right? Now, we usually take that like, oh, well, if you got the look from your mom, you knew you better sit up and pay attention. We get that look. But you know, there's also another look. It's just a look of affirmation. It's a look of pleasure. It's a look of, I I see what you've done and I recognize it. It's a look of direction. It's a look of, it's okay, that God could guide us with his eye? Can God guide you with just the subtle indication of his desire? Or does he need, in a sense, the bit and bridle? Abram was learning of the blessing of submission. And he was about to embark on the greatest journey of his life. Dr. Graham Scroge once made this comment. He said, the callings of God never leave a man where they find him. For to stay where he is after God has bidden him to move on is itself a backward movement, though he may take no actual step. May I encourage you to not delay in the invitation that God may be presenting to you to follow him. The delay in itself is disobedience and disobedience is always dangerous. I wonder if God isn't also calling you saying, blessing awaits. What is the next step that God has for you? You say, well, well, I know he has this step, but he hasn't given me all the details. How many details do you need to take just the next step? Remember for all of us, delay in itself can be disobedience and disobedience is always dangerous. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes 
when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.